Hello and welcome, my name is Meeples, she, they, and this is Literally Graphic. And today we are looking at The Hard Tomorrow by Eleanor Davis, a book I was successfully putting off reading until Sucre's library asked me what I thought over on Twitter. Check out the channel! Content notes for shirtlessness of all genders, nudity, some discreet sex otherwise, police road stop, police violence, elder death, discouraging violence against inanimate objects, violence against women, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, protesting the use of sarin gas, trouble conceiving and having a baby, dismissive partner, and paranoid prepper slash man's, men's rights dude. This pretty hype book was originally published in 2019 by Drawn and Quarterly. This is my first Eleanor Davis read, but according to her website bio, quote, she's a cartoonist and illustrator. Her books include How to Be Happy, You and a Bike and a Road, Why Art, and the Secret Science Alliance, and the copycat crook. She lived in Athens, Georgia, pre-COVID, and Texan, Arizona, mid-COVID, end quote. And while the content notes do read like a keyword list as well, here's a couple more keywords that would apply. Body hair, van life, gardening, and DIY homestead. The Goodreads description of the book is as follows. Hannah is a 30-something wife, home health worker, and anti-war activist. Her husband, Johnny, is a stay-at-home pothead working or, quote, working on building them a house before the winter chill sets in. They're currently living and screwing in the back of a truck hoping for pregnancy, which seems like it will never come. Legs in the air for a better chance at conception, Hannah scans fertility, reddits while Johnny dreams about propagating plants, kale, tomatoes, to ensure they have sufficient sustenance should the end times come. Which, given their fragile democracy strained under the weight of a carceral state and the risk of horrible war, doesn't seem so far off. Helping Hannah in her fight for the future is her best friend Gabby, a queer naturalist she idolizes and who adores her. Helping Johnny build the house is Tyler, an off-the-grid conspiracy theorist driven sick by his own cloudy notions of reality. Told with tenderness and care in an undefined near future, Eleanor Davis's The Hard Tomorrow blazes unrestrained as moments of human connection are doused in fears and threats. Her astute projections probe at current anxieties in a cautionary tale that begs the question, what will happen after tomorrow? Paranoia, as well as hope versus hopelessness, were both themes that felt intrinsic to the understanding of this book. Also growing up, it was very impressive how much Davis was able to communicate via her not overly complicated art style. Simple does not seem totally the right word here as sometimes there are many elements at play in, on the page, but it does feel like Davis is paring things down to focus on only the most important characteristics. Everything shown on the page, words or otherwise, is serving a specific purpose to advance the story. Taking my list of intersections a bit out of order, I didn't initially realize how important the idea of Jewishness was to this book, and even just doing my minimal research into what other people have to say about the book was very enlightening. Basically, I noted that Johnny mentioned once that Hannah is Jewish, wondered if Eleanor Davis is Jewish, did a search on DuckDuckGo, and came across an article on the apparently recently launched Solrad, an online literary magazine for comics, entitled The Judaism of Eleanor Davis, The Hard Tomorrow. Link in the description to the article itself. To summarize, Daniel Elkin effortlessly broke down the ways that Judaism impacted The Hard Tomorrow. This explains some references that went straight over my head and did add some depth that I felt was lacking initially. Something like this would likely be a good introduction to the comic if it ever gets another edition, because I could see how it would be less than helpful to spoon feed some of these references to people, but otherwise it did come across as a bit shallow at times. Digging into that a bit further, aside from representation, it did feel like many of the characters in the story, at most, fulfill archetypes. More than once I thought to myself, of course they did that, because, well, that is what the, the those kinds of people do. Of course, if you 
don't know enough activists, maybe you, similarly to my experience with the Jewish references, would not get these references, which is a bit of a shortcoming, I think. Is it wrong to want people to explain their motivations a bit more? There's not really any character development. It sometimes just feels like a series of events. Gender representation was interesting. I so rarely find body hair rep, so this was super awesome. The way that Davis draws naked bodies in a casual way, well, I think it was awesome. Haven't talked about that in a while. Of the characters who could be labeled as main or main adjacent, we do have men and women, but apparently nothing outside the binary. I'm not sure how I felt about the depiction of men. Besides characters we only see in passing, Hannah is annoyed with her husband for most of the story, and his friend is an asshole. Which is a great transition to sexuality representation. This book is primarily about a man and a woman who are apparently married and trying to have a baby. Besides that, Hannah, the woman in this straight passing relationship, is also in a very close relationship with a queer woman named Gabby. And I have complicated feelings. On the one hand, it is nice to show how even if someone is in a straight passing relationship, this does not mean someone is just straight and not queer. That's it. What we got was Johnny being jealous and Hannah idolizing Gabby in a way that just left me feeling anxious. Because most of my anxiety revolves around relationships and communication. And Hannah just seemed to be acting in a way that left Gabby kind of uncomfortable and not good. The relationship also ends abruptly in a way that sort of makes sense. But again, I would like there to have been more of an explanation for it. I was mostly left wondering why Johnny and Hannah were together. Especially after their simultaneous freakouts that involved him hitting her? Question mark? That said, I did understand why Hannah and Johnny were trying to have a baby. That's because Eleanor Davis sees herself as focusing on the dichotomy between hopefulness and hopelessness. Procreating is a bit of a hot button topic among people who do leftist activism. Personally, I feel like both sides have a point and it's kind of up to people what direction they want to go in. In her book, Davis does come down pretty hard on the side of the world is terrible, but we are trying to build a better one for our children. And having children is part of that, which is something Hannah does basically say in the book itself. Davis also communicates feelings about peaceful protest, do not knock over newspaper boxes, and guns are only for right-wing libertarian types. And while I can understand these opinions, eh... If I was writing a fictional book that centered around protesting, I would have preferred there to be more diversity of ideas presented. Not to say that Davis should not have expressed her opinion through a book that she wrote, but make an argument for them. Don't just erase everyone who disagrees with you. She does do this when it comes to Johnny's friend Tyler, who Davis fairly clearly disagrees with, but is allowed to say things. Probably the most universally agreed upon opinion expressed in this book, Davis's depiction of police officers, was fairly well done and offered some nuance that didn't compromise. My thoughts about class changed the most through my reading of the book, mostly because my impression of the van life is it does take a certain amount of privilege. Not to say that impoverished people do not live in their cars, but I think it has to do with the aesthetic. I wonder, are these trust fund babies? And well, this is not definitively addressed in the book, because no one's backgrounds are fully explored. I did appreciate the panic that Hannah went in at the end when she loses her job. Very relatable. But yeah, wouldn't it be more expensive to build your own house? I don't know. That part just magically resolves itself between the main end and the flash to the future. This ability is largely ignored in this book, which is a bit odd at times because Hannah is both a personal support worker of some kind for an elderly woman and is having trouble conceiving. Also, plenty of activists are not perfectly able-bodied. Particularly with the infertility plotline, it just sort of magically resolves and the elderly woman dies, which really perpetuates the ableist idea that people are born, they are generally able-bodied, and then they get old, things maybe start breaking down, and then they die. It's not unusually bad, but also not great either. Although bad guy Tyler does wear glasses and have to keep applying a substance to his eye throughout his time in the comic. Kind of adjacent to ugly equals bad, maybe? That said, before I conclude entirely, I also wanted to talk about the theme of paranoia that was also pretty prominent throughout the book. On the one hand, we have Hannah and her community being paranoid about the government cracking down on them, which does happen on the other side, we have Johnny's friend Tyler, whose paranoia has driven him into almost total isolation and whose fears appear to be shown to be false when Johnny accidentally kills him. Because that happened. 
with no resolution. A little bit black and white, but not something I see explored very often. So interesting. Yeah, the ending kind of works aesthetically, but not really in any sort of thought out way, unless the logic is literally give up protesting and your life will magically resolve into hippie heterosexual bliss. They say that the simplest solution is generally correct, but that is a bad conclusion in my humble opinion. Overall, while I might have flirted a couple of times with giving this book four stars, after thinking so much about all the ways I don't think it works, I feel like three stars is probably as high as I should go, but let's go with two stars. It's okay. Your mileage will mostly vary depending on how much you agree or disagree with Davis's political opinions. It is a different kind of story and setting than I was expecting, or generally see presented in fairly hyped indie comic books, but it does come across as very shallow. I think the strongest points of the book are the art and things unique to this being a comic. Otherwise, minimalism worked much better in the art and much worse on the plot side of things. And as always, literally graphic is created on land that should be given back to the traditional land holders, which in this case is, to my knowledge, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, Anishinaabe people, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat Nation.